Uh, they're my Why Your Legend friends. Professor Anthony Sweat here from BYU Church History and Doctrine. Welcome to another great episode of the podcast. As any one of you listeners know who has ever had a child, there's quite a bit of pressure that comes when you're going to name a baby. Do you go traditional, family legacy, or just names that you like? Do you listen to or ignore what other people are thinking when you give them suggestions? Do you just go with your gut? Well, whatever your method, one thing is for sure. You have a preference for certain types of names over others, and so do I. Have you ever noticed that? You hear a certain name and you think, oh, that's a great name. And when you hear other names, you think, I would never name my kid that in a million years. Well, there's actually a science behind naming kids that reflects our own biases. There is even a fascinating website called Magic Baby Names that uses both genealogy and technology to find out the type of names that you probably will like. Just go on there and type in a name that you're considering, and it will kick out about a hundred similar suggestions. In writing the intro for this episode, I jumped on there and typed in my youngest son's name, Truman. When I typed in Truman, Magic Baby Names gave me other suggestions I might like, such as Eli, which just so happens to be what we named my oldest son. It also gave me the suggestion of the name Cal, which happens to be what we named my second son. It gave the name Henry, a name that we had considered but didn't use. It also gave me the suggestion of George, which is what we used for my youngest son's middle name. It also kicked out names like Jason, my wife's brother's name, Leo, my grandfather, and William. That was a name that we had considered, but we didn't end up using it because, well, you can't really name a kid Will Sweat. That would scar him for life. The phenomenon of naming preferences has a lot to do with today's episode. It is estimated that the Book of Mormon introduced to the world 188 names that it had never heard before. Names like Lehi, Nephi, Helaman, Shiblon, Moronihi, Amalekiah, Korahor, Pahoran, Lamoni, Zeezrom, and many more. Just where did these names come from, though? And if Joseph Smith was making up the Book of Mormon, would they reflect his or his family's preferences and patterns of speech? This is something that Professor Brad Wilcox has spent the last decade researching and, together with some of his colleagues, has recently published an article on. So many people are so quick to say Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. And I thought, if he wrote it, then wouldn't we be able to see Joseph Smith the same way I was able to see these school children in their stories? Wouldn't we be able to see Joseph Smith in the names that he was choosing, the names that he was inventing, so to speak? And uh, wouldn't that surface as we analyze those names? In today's episode, you will get to hear a decade's worth of research about what surfaced when the names in the Book of Mormon were analyzed, research that has recently been published in a chapter called Book of Mormon Names, A Collection That Defies Expectations. So, let's get ready to have our expectations defied. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Brad Wilcox, who normally interviews as part of our Why Religion team, was interviewed himself by his colleague and Why Religion team member, Jared Halverson, to talk about Professor Wilcox's recent research publication on naming patterns in the Book of Mormon. In part one, we'd like to look at why this research was done. So here, Dr. Wilcox shares why he did this article on naming in the Book of Mormon, 
providing some statistics on unique names in the Book of Mormon and whether those names are or are not related to Joseph Smith's culture and background. He will also discuss naming probabilities, a thing called the name letter effect, and share some of his unique research on something that he calls phonoprints. I'm here with my friend and colleague, mentor and personal hero, Brad Wilcox. <laughs> well, that's uh, about the nicest introduction I've ever received. Uh, believe me, you've been influencing my life since I was a teenager. And it's, uh, forgive me for, fa- for fanboying here, but, I, but I'm, a, I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have to, to get to, to spend some time together and discuss an amazing article that you rec- recently had written uh, or published in quite the, quite the venue. This is a chapter that appears in a book uh, written by, or published by a, a national publish, publication. It's a Perspectives on Latter-day Saint Names and Naming, Names, Identity, and Belief. Uh, would, would you speak a little bit about the book before we get into the article itself, Brad? The book itself is kind of a landmark because it's published by Rutledge, which is a national publisher, but they're publishing something specifically about Latter-day Saints. This book is is something that Dallin D. Oaks, this is Elder Oaks' son, um, has been working on for years, and along with a couple of his other colleagues, they have pulled together chapters on all kinds of different uh, connections uh, between our faith and our names. And the book explores an intersection. There's lots of books on naming and names. There's a whole field of study called onomastics, which is the study of names. And there are professional journals devoted just to this. But people usually steer clear of one intersection between names and the significant element of people's identity that is religious belief. Dallin and his his colleagues have just hit that nail right on the head, and it has been reviewed. It has been, uh, you know, peer reviewed by people who are not members of the church, but they see the contribution that Dallin has made. This is really an exceptional piece of work coming out of Brigham Young University. Well, I love that the rest of the scholarly community is going to be taking this topic seriously and seeing, as you, as you put it, the intersection of names and naming with religious identity is, is powerful. Now, with, as we drill deeper into your specific chapter, the title of your chapter is Book of Mormon Names, A Collection That Defies Expectation. And I'll admit, when I first discovered this article, and I saw that it was about Book of Mormon names in a volume about Latter-day Saint names and naming, I I assumed that you'd be writing about the prevalence of LDS parents naming their children after figures in the Book of Mormon. But what amazed me when I read your article, this chapter, it's so much bigger than that. Yeah, you talk about things most of us have never heard of, like phonemes and phonotactics, uh, but you also mention people that we probably all f- are familiar with, like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and Brandon Mole. Yeah, even Brandon Mole, are, who, who does uh, fantasy mm-hmm. writing as well. So, so I'm curious, uh, c- could you explain what this article is about and really what got you interested in, in such a fascinating topic? This, this has been something that has consumed my scholarly efforts for well over a decade. Uh, it started for me back when I was helping children. My, my doctorate is in literacy, so I've spent much of my career teaching children to read, teaching children to write, and teaching teachers how to teach children to read and write. Back during the Harry Potter craze, when everybody was all reading Harry Potter books and nothing else, um, as children would write, I was noticing something. They were patterning after the names in this fantasy, the, these made-up names, and they were writing their own Harry Potter-like stories, but they were using names that they were making up, but they sounded very similar <laughs> to the Harry Potter names. They would change them. Instead of Dumbledore, we'd have Mumblemore. <laughs> Instead of Hagrid, we'd have Bagrid. And, you know, it was usually Mary who was writing about Mumblemore, and, you know, Dagrid was being written by David. And so I could start identifying 
kids, without even looking at who was writing the little story, I could start identifying kids by how they were inventing or choosing names for their little stories. And I started thinking, so many people are so quick to say, Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. And I thought, if he wrote it, then wouldn't we be able to see Joseph Smith the same way I was able to see these school children in their stories? Wouldn't we be able to see Joseph Smith in the names that he was choosing, the names that he was inventing, so to speak? And uh, wouldn't that surface as we analyze those names. So I started to study it myself. I teamed up with some colleagues, and I led a cross-departmental team. Uh, Wendy Baker-Smimo from Linguistics, uh, Sharon Black from Education, Bruce Brown, he's from Psychology, but he is just a wonderful statistician. And we were able to team up for years and just start drilling down into how are authors identified when they choose or invent names, and is that a pattern we see in Joseph Smith's life? That's amazing. This, what a multidisciplinary work. And in some ways, you're going to need all of those disciplines to weigh in on on a concept that's so so complicated. I, I was struck as you give us some some Book of Mormon names by the numbers uh, at the beginning of your chapter. I, I love the Book of Mormon. I've studied it my entire life, but I had underestimated just what a cast of characters we have in this Book of Scripture. So here's Book of Mormon names by the numbers. There are 337 proper names, as you pointed out. 149 of them are also found in the Bible, but that leaves 188 that are found only in the Book of Mormon. Of those 188, 162 belong to people. Uh, 160 are men and two are women. And some names belong to multiple people. Uh, lots of Nephi's there, for example. Yeah, and, and Morianton, who belongs to two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there's two Moriantons, two Mosiahs, two Ammons. I mean, yeah. it gets a little confusing. <laughs> but after accounting for those, that, that repetition, you've got 126 names that belong to a single individual in the Book of Mormon. And like I said, that is an amazing cast of characters. Which begs the question that, that you wrestle with in this, in this chapter, if you were making up the Book of Mormon as some kind of work of fiction, if this is Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, you've got to come up with a, a plot line that's, that's powerful, but this host of characters that you have to create with their own personalities, their own storylines, and what I think goes underappreciated, their own names. And so what would you expect of those names in the Book of Mormon, if Joseph Smith or Solomon Spaulding or whomever else, if they had written the Book of Mormon themselves, what, what would we expect? It's really interesting because most of the research that's been done on names in the Book of Mormon uh, is looking for the affinity of Book of Mormon names with Semitic languages. So there's been a lot of research that says these names are similar to names that you would find in the Middle East, or these are similar to names that have been found anciently on, on ancient documents. And that research is uh, solid and it is fascinating. But we wanted to look through some new lenses. We wanted to look through uh, a few, come at this from a fresh angle. For example, do the names reveal Joseph Smith's personal background? Do they reveal Joseph Smith in the sounds of Joseph Smith's names? And also, do they have a, ph a phonological pattern of the way the sounds are put together that can be linked to Joseph Smith the way we can link those patterns to other authors? Um, it led to three basic studies. One considered whether there were personal or cultural identifiers that were that were in the Book of Mormon. And then the second one focused on how do authors choose names? If you're writing a fiction book, how do they do that? We interviewed dozens of authors and were able to kind of see patterns in the way they do things. And then we were looking to see, are these patterns being followed by 
Joseph Smith if he were the author of the book. And then finally, those two studies are very qualitative in nature. And so sometimes people can say, well, there's, there's not a real solid evidence there. It's interesting, but it's not a solid evidence that we can count on. So we also looked at the names in a quantitative way. We wanted to look at the probabilities, look at the numbers, look, and, and be able to see if we could find something there that, uh, that would stand up statistically. It was so well organized in, in your chapter along those three lenses, those three meth- methodological approaches. So yeah, walk us through, and uh, listeners, prepare yourselves for quite the lesson. Well, the one thing you've got to remember is that some of this stuff might be new to listeners, but in scholarly circles, uh, these things are not uh, these things are accepted. There's a lot of research that backs them up. For example, the name letter effect. The name letter effect means that people have an unconscious as well as a conscious preference for the letters in their names, specifically their initials and the phonemes or the consonant and vowel sounds that are in their names. This surfaces in everything from uh, you know, people naming their children. Christina names her son Christian. Marriage partners, Paul marries Paula. The jobs that they're interested in, Laura studies law. Even the places they choose to live, Maria lives in Minneapolis. Uh, and what they buy, Nick likes Nikes. I mean, you, this is stuff that's been researched for years. So, in books, we see authors often revealing themselves through the names they choose for their characters or invent. For example, Stephanie Meyer, she talks in her Twilight series, there are nine characters that start with S. There are 11 that start with the M sound, Myers, and there are uh, you know, you see the same thing in Brandon Mull's Fable Haven series. Six of the characters start with B, seven start with M, and these that's a significant number when you look at all the characters together. You realize that's a pretty high percentage of their character names that are starting literally with their initials. Um, Dean Hughes, he's the author of many novels, and he often will write himself into the book and call the character Dennis, Dean, Dennis. Now, he's doing that consciously, but C.S. Lewis did the same thing, and he did it completely. He never did it intentionally. 23 of the character names in his fantasies come with, start with C, 18 begin with S, 8 begin with L, Lewis, and his nickname was Jack, and there are three characters. One is named Jack, one is named Jack Daw, and the other is Edith Jackal. Wow. So, wow. these were not conscious choices on his part, but you see how they surface. Well, even someone as sophisticated a writer as he, that you almost, you can't help it. That subconscious, there it is. Yeah. And, and then you look at, at authors who were in the previous century— so, in 19th century, we had Nathaniel Hawthorne, and he exhibits a strong na- letter name effect. Edgar Allan Poe exhibits the same effect. So, if the Book of Mormon is a piece of fiction written by Joseph Smith, wouldn't we expect to see the same pattern we see in other authors? That's what we thought. But as we analyze the sounds, not just the letters— but because the sound, T and H, the sound is th, and, you know, not just the letters, but the sounds in the name, we were able to find out that it's not there. Now, Joseph does, does there is a character, there is someone in the book named Joseph, but if the book is from a Hebrew background, then you would expect the name Joseph to be there, whether the author was Joseph or not. Exactly. It appears uh, a lot less than more prominent biblical names like Noah and like Benjamin. So even in the case that he has Joseph in the book, 
it doesn't necessarily follow the same pattern that other authors are following. So that was one thing that we looked at that was just fascinating. Now, as we look at rules of authorship, we interviewed many successful fiction writers, and we found that authors do select names very quickly, or, or they, they do not select names very quickly or carelessly. They really take time working on their names. And yet, Joseph Smith produced the entire Book of Mormon in 60 to 65 working days. That is not the same pattern that most authors use. We also find that fiction writers make names accessible so that people can remember the names and distinguish between the characters. Well, that's not the case in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> that's I mean, for sure. how, many, how many of the names start with L and how many of the names start with, I mean, you've got a lot of confusion almost as the names are stacking up on top of each other. Um, authors will carefully fit names to personalities and backgrounds, and yet you've got the, one of the most wicked characters in the book being named Noah, a righteous prophet from the Old Testament. So, you've, we just as we looked at the way that authors do it, and then we see the way the book actually unfolds, two Almas, three Aarons, um, you've got two Amalekites, but then you've got Abinadi, Abinadam, Abish, Akish, Amulek, Amulon, Antipas. That's not accessible. It's not carefully constructed to, to amplify a character's personality. We're just not seeing the same rules being followed that are followed by typical, uh, typical fiction authors. Now, does Joseph's disregard for the rules of naming characters indicate that he is a careless craftsman, like he just didn't know the rules, or does it indicate that he was a careful translator? And our research kind of opens the door for people to think about that a little bit. The last, uh, the last research that we've been working on has to do with, um, with a quantitative dimension. We've looked at the phonemes, sounds. We've looked at phonotactics, sound patterns. And if Joseph Smith was a fiction writer, then the Book of Mormon names would be expected to show the same kind of phonotactic or phonemic patterns that fiction writers have produced. So we compared J.R.R. Tolkien, very highly skilled linguist and author, um, and we compared that with Solomon Spaulding, who was a first-time and little-known writer in Joseph Smith's time, and we compared it with the U.S. Census, the names that were being used in actual naming situations in the time period. And we were able to show that they didn't connect. Jared, what do you know about word prints? Well, it seems like fingerprints. Uh, you can recognize that it's the, the work of a single author, for example. And try as they might to invent dialogue for other characters, there's still a sense that the underlying structure it comes from a single mind. Yeah, there have been decades of work on word prints. And even though it's not quite as, uh, you know, it's not quite as accurate, it's not quite as, as right on as a fingerprint, it's this, the research still holds up in a court of law. I mean, if, if you're my dad and you leave a will and leave all the money to my brother and me, then I'm going to contest that. And how are they going to say this will was forged? They're going to say, well, um, we're going to compare it to other writing of Jared's that we know he wrote. And then we're going to examine these patterns and we're going to come up with a percentage of possibility. We're going to say, um, there's enough matches that we're 95% sure this is authentic. And then my brother gets rich and I don't get anything. <laughs> um, but if they say, uh, there's only a 10% match, then I have a leg to stand on in my argument that maybe this was written by my brother or somebody else. Well, they've done word print studies on the Book of Mormon. They've shown that 
The Book of Mormon doesn't match Joseph Smith's pattern for choosing words in sentences. It doesn't match the work of Oliver Cowdery. It doesn't match the work of Sidney Rigdon. They can prove, like stand up in a court of law, prove that the book had multiple authors. Word prints have been a way to identify authors for years, but we started looking at phonoprints. It's actually a term that I came up with because it's looking at the way people are putting sounds together. And can authors be identified not just by their words, but can they be identified by the sounds they make up in words that they are inventing or even in the names they're choosing? Hugh Nibley said something very interesting about Book of Mormon names. He said, because the names may be the only thing left in the book that's coming from its authentic roots. Maybe that's our window into the language of these people because everything else is translated into English. And maybe these names give us a little snippet, a little view of what the language was like. Wow. So we started looking at these names. The American Name Society, where some of this research has been presented, some of the people there started calling me the father of phonoprints. And I thought, well, I don't think I'm putting that on my gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting that this kind of research has never been done before. And as we looked at these names, then we, re we started realizing that there was a phonoprint. There was a way that Tolkien was putting together names. Even though he claimed they came from different languages, and even though he claimed that they, you know, dwarf names were different than hobbit names, and even though he made claims that these were different, the same pattern came because he is the same inventor of all those names, and he's gravitating toward the same sounds. And in the same way, we found that, uh, that uh, Solomon Spaulding did it as well, and much, much less gracefully I can imagine. as J.R.R. Tolkien. But how did that compare to the names from the census? Names that were coming from Germanic background, Hebrew background, English Latin, Greek, French, Aramaic, even Phoenician. See, we found that in there, there wasn't a common pattern. These names that were authentic names from authentic sources didn't share the same pattern as the names that authors were choosing and inventing. So with that in mind, where did the names of the Book of Mormon fall? They fell more in line with the authentic names than they did with the fiction names. Then we went even deeper, and we looked at the different names in J.R.R. Tolkien's works. So, man, I know more about orcs and, <laughs> and <laughs> hobbits and humans and elves, and I mean, I know more about that now than I ever wanted to know. We started looking at these different names dwarf names, which Tolkien said were based on different languages, and yet those patterns still existed. Now, we broke the Book of Mormon names down into Lamanite names, Nephite names, Mulekite names, and Jaredite names. And what we found is that J.R.R. Tolkien's phonoprint was seen throughout all the different types of characters. But the that wasn't true in the Book of Mormon. Statistically, the Nephite names were different than the Mulekite names, and then the Lamanite names, and the Jaredite names. How did Joseph Smith pull that off? I mean, if he's making all this up, where was his phonoprint? And why were the names that he claimed were from different cultures truly different from each other, like census names, rather than 
having that commonality that we found in even an author as bright and talented as J.R.R. Tolkien. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place for you to check out. The RSC has recently published a new book called Battlefields to Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia, edited by Devin Jensen and Rosalind Menno Ram. This is the first comprehensive history of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia. After Japan's bombings of Hawaii, Guam, and Wake Island, Latter-day Saint military personnel arrived in Micronesia. Waves of missionaries began teaching the military personnel and islanders, leading to the creation of the Micronesia Guam Mission and the Marshall Islands Maruho Mission. Some of these former Pacific battlefields have now become peaceful temple grounds. And you can read about the great history that happened there in a book called Battlefields, to Temple Grounds, Latter-day Saints in Guam and Micronesia. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Brad Wilcox discuss his research article, Book of Mormon Names, A Collection That Defies Expectation, published in a book called Perspectives on Latter-day Saint Names and Naming, published by Rutledge Press. In part two of Why Religion, we like to explore a little bit more why this research matters. How can it help or inform us in living, learning, or loving aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? In this part two, Professor Wilcox will discuss how his research has influenced the way that he sees Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. Let me ask you a question as we move into this second portion of our interview. Uh, you said something in the in the chapter that re- really resonated with me. You wrote, if Joseph Smith invented the names in the Book of Mormon, as some critics have claimed, he was successful at avoiding types of standardization and stereotyping that had not yet been discovered and identified when the Book of Mormon yeah, was nobody produced nobody knew what the letter name, you know, the name <laughs> exactly. letter effect, nobody knew what that was back in his day. Exactly. You conclude there that the names seem to have been chosen randomly as genuine historical individuals would have chosen them. Like you said earlier, that's closer to what you saw in the census patterns rather than what you saw in works of, of fiction. So I'm just wondering, a more specific question first and then a more general after. How has your research affected how you view Joseph Smith and the part he played in the publication of the Book of Mormon? Well, the Book of Mormon names comprise a collection that simply defies expectations. The names... You just cannot boil this down to something that's simple or something that can easily be brushed aside. Both how the Book of Mormon came to be and the text itself is offered to the world to encourage people to step away into a realm of faith, step away from the security of their senses and the way they typically learn and know and to step into a realm where they have to say, if this book can't be explained by saying Joseph Smith wrote it, God had to be involved. And if God was involved in this, then God is there and he can be involved in my life. And the minute we step into that realm of faith, then that's when God can begin to work his miracles in our lives. Oh, that, that a perfect lead into my my other question because you've broadened things to to encompass the reality of God Himself. I, I'm curious because at the beginning of your article you quote Daniel Walker Howe, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, uh, incredible mind, expert in the, the exact time period uh, that Joseph Smith lived in, and and served in, and he wrote this. He he wasn't trying to weigh in on whether the Book of Mormon was true or false. But he said, the Book of Mormon should rank among the great achievements of American literature. Now, how often do you hear that? <laughs> exactly. But, but he went on. It has never been accorded the status it deserves. Since Mormons deny Joseph Smith's authorship and non-Mormons dismissing the work as a fraud have been more likely to ridicule than read it. 
Now, obviously, you take the Book of Mormon incredibly seriously, both intellectually as well as spiritually, like you just said. So why do you think that others, both inside and outside the church, should take the Book of Mormon more seriously themselves? I think that was Dallin, Dallin's intent in, in compiling this book, which has taken him many years. And I think the reviewers of the book recognized that he's giving some things here that, that are inviting people to look at the book as something much deeper than they've seen and much broader than what they have imagined. And perhaps, maybe just perhaps, we can encourage a few people to stop ridiculing the book and start reading the book. You, you're, this article does such a great job of slowing people down in their, how in their race to dismiss something they haven't taken seriously, they haven't actually investigated. And so to, to have to pause, to have to consider, just, it, it doesn't add up that Joseph is just writing a work of fiction. Maybe it's worth putting my toe in the water and exercising some faith and giving it a chance. And the minute they chance. start there, then they've opened the door until they're willing to show that faith. Oh, I'll believe if I have a sign. I'll believe if there's a study that comes out that absolutely proves that the Book of Mormon is true. Then I'll believe. Uh uh. Uh uh. Jesus said in the Americas, you know, it is better than seeing. It is better for those who believe on your words. He said to Thomas, Thomas, you're better off. You know, you've seen and you believe, but it's better. For, well, how can it be better? Well, because God isn't just concerned about our seeing, our knowing. He's concerned about our changing, our growing. And that's why he pushes us into this realm of faith where we have to reveal our hearts. We have to choose to believe. We show where our hearts truly are. And that allows us to start building a relationship. Laman and Lemuel saw, but they never had a relationship with God. Nephi and Sam saw, but they also chose faith which allowed them to have a relationship that blessed their lives and the lives of their posterity for generations. If you're interested in reading Professor Wilcox's article, Book of Mormon Names, a collection that defies expectation, we have provided a link to the book in the podcast episode description and also on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. We have also provided links to some free and open available research articles on Book of Mormon naming patterns that Professor Wilcox has published over the last decade. Okay, we've arrived at our last segment, part three, where we like to discuss things a little bit more personally with the professor. Since Professor Wilcox has been interviewed on Why Religion before, episode number 46 called Answers About Patriarchal Blessings, one of our top downloaded episodes in the history of Why Religion, by the way. Here, we aren't going to have him tell us about his journey that brought him to BYU. Instead, in this last part, Professor Wilcox will share a little bit more personally about his unique calling and service the last few years in the general young men's presidency of the church and some lessons that he has learned serving in that calling. As we end this this hour, uh, let's go back to the to the life that you've been spent that, that you've been spending studying this, uh, and not just this particular topic, but but the gospel in general and teaching it. I'd love to let our listeners hear from you about some of your church service because it's fascinating. Yeah, since 2020, you've been serving in the Young Men's General Presidency, and so your classroom has now expanded across the entire world. And I'm curious, with all of your travel, with meeting especially young people from different cultures, 
I'm sure with names with different phonoprints uh, all over them. Uh, what what are some of the lessons that you've learned through that service that perhaps you didn't know or maybe fully appreciate before? This has been a fascinating time to serve because, you know, the minute we were called, the world shut down. I mean, I was called in March. Uh, we were sustained at that April General Conference, and that was right when the whole world was shutting down because of COVID. They, those were some difficult years, especially for the youth. And uh, it, it, it's been an interesting time to try to reach out, to try to kindle faith, to try to help them in in this moment of such fear and darkness and um, and death. It, it just was a time when a lot of people were uh, isolated and felt very alone. So being able to serve during that time was a blessing. To be able to assure youth that they were not alone, that they were not wrong, that, that our religion was able to help them maintain temporally, spiritually, through that storm. And that by listening to the prophet, by being close to God, that they would be able to be part of a solution in a world that had nothing but problems. It was encouraging for them to be able to realize that being part of organized religion is the very thing that allowed them to reach out to others individually and as a church to be to be able to bless others and so that was a special time but it's also been fascinating since covid pandemic has ended to be able to watch the youth bounce back i am so impressed with the youth and the young single adults of this church you see them at fsys you see these youth hungry to gather. Last year, we had 100,000 teenagers just in North America. And this year, we're expecting about 130,000 teenagers. That means we've needed about 3,000 counselors. And you think, what other church puts this most significant and expensive opportunity within the grasp of youth and then trusts it to other youth. <laughs> I mean, you go to an FSY session, you can count the adults on one hand. It's the young adults who are leading the youth, and they look at these young adults and they say, oh man, she can dance like a crazy woman and she still reads the scriptures. <laughs> he, he can scream and yell at the games until he loses his voice, and yet he still praise. And they look at these college kids and they say, gosh, they're just a little older than I am. But if they can do it, I can do it. And they find that there are other youth who share their same standards and values, and they, they suddenly don't feel alone. And it's been wonderful to watch that and wonderful to see how they've bounced back. Uh, we're comparing now the indicators in 2019, which was pre-COVID, to the indicators of last year, 2022, which is considered post-COVID. And we're seeing the upticks. We're seeing the upticks. Of course, there's going to be an uptick from COVID to non-COVID, but we're seeing upticks from 2019 to now. We're seeing more on-time ordinations for deacons, teachers, priests. We're seeing more temple recommends for youth. We're seeing increased seminary attendance. We're seeing the number of mission applications starting to soar. We're seeing that go up by double-digit percentages, both internationally and domestically. Our youth are bouncing back. And in a time when so many churches are struggling to retain their youth and young adults, and we have our own struggles, but we're doing better than most, to see these youth not just having survived COVID, but literally thriving, we're seeing this uptick, we're seeing the, the curve that was headed down 
turning and starting to head up. And on the, on an individual note, you know, I see them in my classes. I see them when I speak. I see them in the Dominican Republic. I see them in Kenya. I see them in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in South America. I've, I see them all over the world. I see hope. I see light. And I see love. Love for their Savior. Love for the prophet. I see love. And I see this incredible strength. I mean, that's a lot to ask of these young kids. In a world of social media, where even adults feel pressured and bombarded, these kids are willing to stand against the storm. They're willing to walk against the flow. They're willing, the whole world's flowing down here, and they're willing to stand and just start moving against that current. It just makes me so happy. Although there are some who are turning away, we focus on how many are staying and how many are finding that strength and they are making it through because of their faith, not in spite of their faith. And God bless them. I just am so proud of our youth. I'm so proud of our young single adults. I love them. Jared, I love them with all of my heart. I have hugged them on every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> if, if I went down there, I'd probably hug some penguins <laughs> or some scientists. <laughs> But on every other continent, I have hugged those kids. I have held them in my arms. And I have been inspired by their goodness and their testimonies and their strength. Man, prophet calls them the hope of Israel. They are the hope of Israel. And Israel is the hope of the world. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Alec Galloway. Say hi, Alec. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.